Hey folks, just wanted to let you know that today's guest on Jazz Watch, organist and pianist Mike Ladon, is putting together a special celebration benefit concert for Disability Pride in New York City. The concert will be January 8th at Quaker's Friends Meeting House at 7 p.m. in New York City, featuring an all-star cast of Ron Carter, Benny Golson, George Coleman, Brad Meldow, Harold Mayburn, Jimmy Cobb, and many, many others. For more information, visit disabilitypridenyc.com. Are you hearing the other music? Welcome to Jazz Watch. Yours truly, the watchman over the microphone here for another edition of this podcast. We appreciate all the wonderful feedback that we've been getting. People checking out uh, each consecutive episode, actually. This is going to be one that you'll definitely want to check out. And so glad that you've chosen to be with us here. You can reach out to us with your feedback and anything uh, you'd like to say suggestion wise to gbjazzwatch at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter, our mother site that catalogs all of our episodes. That's jazzwatch.wordpress.com. And as always, we're on Facebook too. That's facebook.com slash jazzwatch. Joining us on this edition of the show, pianist and organist extraordinaire, Mr. Mike Ladon. This was a great chat, and we're glad to bring it to you for this edition of the show. Uh, Mike has a chart-topping CD with his band. He calls it the Groover Quartet, and it's an all-star cast of guitarist Peter Bernstein, drummer Joe Farnsworth, tenor saxophonist Eric Alexander. At the helm on the B3, Mike Ladon, I Love Music, is his latest recording, just issued a couple of months ago. And uh, it's performed quite well on the radio charts, and it's gotten quite critically acclaimed. It's a beautiful blend, as Mike will speak about, of the R&B tradition that he grew up with as a teenager with the hot, burning, swinging sounds of jazz. This particular quartet can be seen in live action each and every Tuesday at Smoke Jazz Club in New York City. Mike uh, established uh, it's been going for about 15 years now or so organ night on Tuesday there at smoke and this band kind of developed out of that they've had several successive recordings on the high note label and their latest is uh, doing some uh, pretty incredible things we're going to talk to Mike about his matriculation through music as a youngster growing up in Connecticut sort of a very unique uh, background as you'll hear him explain about And we really got to hear some reflections about his college years. Uh, During that time, he was mentored one-on-one with the late, great Jackie Byard, the incredible composer and pianist, band leader. We'll hear Mike's reflections on his relationship with, with Jackie. And Mike's just like the music he performs. Straight ahead, no frills, doesn't sugarcoat, he tells it just like he believes it to be. And I'm sure you'll enjoy hearing his insight on uh, the current scene of music, as well as uh, his particular uh, progression as a musician on the national scene. Mike, of course, enjoying tenures with the great Milt Jackson, late great vibraphonist. Also currently, uh, since the 90s, Benny Golson has called on Mike to be his pianist of choice in several of his endeavors. So Mike talks about that as well. We're going to check out a tune now from Mike and the Groover Quartet. And after that, we'll be back with our chat here on Jazz Watch with the great Mike Ladon, pianist and organist. You'll hear it right now in just a few moments.
was a jazz musician, is that correct? Oh yeah, yeah, full-fledged guitar player. But from back in the day, you know, where he was, uh, his main thing was um, Nat Cole Trio, so he was into this guitar player named Oscar Moore, yeah. who played with Nat Cole, and that's kind of the style. But he was also into Wes and people like that too later on, but um, he's, I'm talking back in the 30s when he started. Man, that's awesome. That's awesome. And uh, it, was it Connecticut that you grew up in? What city? Bridgeport, man. The uh, the city that Urban Renewal never quite got to, unfortunately. <laughs> Not the prettiest part of Connecticut, but it is my hometown. Right on, man. Right on. Now, I know a lot of people talk about, you know, the scene, you know, that were, was in, say, Philly or Detroit or what have you. But Connecticut has produced some cats, too. And, and has had a local, you know, scene in, in, in some of the cities, man. Like True, c- true. Coming up, man, who, who were some of the cats, you know, before you split that you used to uh, you ch- used to check out? You mean in Connecticut? Mm-hmm. Or from there? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, man, I didn't really, uh, well, let's see. I mean, when I was a little kid, nobody that you would have heard of, first of all. But, um, <clears throat> I mean, Charles McPherson, I think, was living near New Haven, and I did get to meet him when I was a kid sitting in in a place called the Roman Jester in New Haven. Um, and believe it or not, I met an avant-garde drummer named Sonny Murray up there in New Haven one time when I was a kid. Yeah. And, um, uh, but uh, as far as people, no, I mean, there was just a local scene of guys, there were these guys named the Buster Brothers. Uh, yeah. Actually, they played great. One played organ and one played drums. And yeah. they actually played with Gene Ammons for a minute. That's right. And my father used to take me to see them when I was a little kid, and that was the first place I ever sat in on organ. I must have been like ten. Wow. At the at this club in in Bridgeport where they used to play, there were a lot of cats in Hungary. See, my father owned a music store, <laughs> and that was the hang with Don's Music Box. So guys would be in there hanging during the day. It also was like a sort of a beginners, like an elementary school of music too. It had in there for for music for students. So um, that's where I grew up in that store. I mean, that was our house, and then turned into a store. And that was everybody used to come in there and hang out all day. And there was a group there that was called it was Walter Jenkins. It was a a, a group of brothers. Uh, the Jenkins brothers, and they had a little group that sounded just like James Brown. Wow. Like, I think they called themselves like WJ and the Flames or something like that. <laughs> and that was the music I was really into when I was a kid. So I used to go see them and just, you know, wish I could play in that group. And that was really like the beginning of the spark of, of me, you know, getting big eyes to, to, to get into this music. Yeah, man. That's awesome. That's really awesome. And I, and I guess, too, as you sort of matriculate, well, let me ask you this first. Man, the Hammond B3 is, is just one of those things where you got to know what you're doing. And, and like, of course, you had the, the, the piano background, but did anybody teach you just kind of how to turn it on, you know, what the stops were and everything? Well, like I say, man, I um, my father owned this music store, so I had plenty of people around to teach me how to turn it on. But um, but I, I didn't really have a B3 till I was 14, I started playing organ when I was 10, though, but I had a, what they called a Farfisa, which mm-hmm. was the brand new item out with the first compact organ. You could pack it up and it was lightweight, but it didn't really sound like a B3, but if you put it through a Leslie, it sounded okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had one of those with a Leslie when I was 10. Mm-hmm. And actually, I had a band when I was 10, an organ trio, and we, but we used to play R&B, like, like I say, like Wilson Pickett and James Brown and Sam and Dave and stuff like that. And um, then when I was 14, I found one, uh, you know, I kept listening to the records. Mm-hmm. No, I never had any formal training on organ. I mean, that's all, I just figured it out mm-hmm. on my own, if that's the question. Mm-hmm. But um, but the thing is, I was always interested in that sound of the organ. And when I was a kid, I had any group that had a organ in it, I had to have the record. You know, and even James Brown's record had some you know, he played some organ a little bit, hold a note, turn the Leslie on or something like that. Right. But, uh, you know, a lot of the rock bands had, I was never that into the rock bands that much, but I remember there was a group called uh, the Rascals, mm-hmm. and they had, uh, they featured organ mm-hmm. in their band. And uh, so there was, you know, like that kind of R&B thing kind of swung me into the organ thing. But then my sister had this record called Jimmy Smith Live at the Village Gate. Yes. And that was the record that just flipped me. 
<laughs> I remember just looking at the cover. Have you ever seen that record? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's got the cover. It's just a picture of Jimmy Smith at the Village Gate with this red light mm -hmm. shining down on him behind the B3. Yeah. And I remember just looking at that picture and being like, whoa, man, see, someday if I could ever do that, that would be awesome. And I just listened to that cut on there. I Got a Woman is on there, and that thing just hooked me back. So when my father, when I found one, I found a B3, uh, you know, what a repossession sale is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Uh, somehow I found that in the paper. There was a repossession sale, and they were selling this organ for two grand with the Leslie and Dolly. Wow. And so my good old dad, man, he went and got it for me and oh, put it in our basement. <laughs> that's killer. And, that's yeah, killer, that's man. that's what uh, that's what really did it. Then I just got down there with my Jimmy Smith records and started trying to figure out what he was doing. Wow. Wow. Man, yeah, that's, that's, awesome. that's been you know. Then I stopped actually playing organ uh, when I was in college. I was just playing piano, and I. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, I mean, my parents were like, what are you going to do? This organ's just sitting in our house taking up space. Are you going to play it or not? And I said, probably not. Mm. So they sold it. Wow. And so I had no organ for years. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I came to New York, and I was playing piano and doing pretty good. And you didn't think about the organ until my friend Jim Snydero called me. I need to look Yeah, he's a great alto saxophone player, one of the best in the world right now. Mm -hmm. And he was playing in Jack McDuff's group at the time. He was in, Jack had a horn section. Yeah. And so he told me to come up to this little bar on 149th Street up in Harlem called Dudes. Because hmm. he was playing with Jack. And so I went up there and then Jack asked me to sit in. And I sat in and um, the great Joe Dukes was playing drums. Oh, wow, wow. And I played a blues. And so I got through, and you know I hadn't played organ in years. And Jack came over and said, "Man, you you're a good organ player. You should think about doing that." So I said, "Wow, if Jack McDuff thinks so. I'm gonna get an organ." <laughs> so I, I, next day I had started looking, and I got another one. So now I've had that since I don't know the '80s. Wow. Sitting here in my house, and you know I used to take it around and play gigs on it, but. That's a monster to move around. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I bet. I bet. <laughs> Man, I don't. I don't want to go too fast because you mentioned something in your college years. One of my favorite pianists of all times was actually one of your teachers, Mr. Jackie Byard. Oh, yeah. And man, I would just love to hear any maybe top of the head anecdote or or, or how are those <laughs> lessons structured? Man, he seems like such a such a creative soul and a fun guy. That's it. Well, you just summed it up right there, man. That's. That's what he was. He, first of all, above all, he was just a beautiful guy. You yeah. know, and uh, as, I, as I always tell people, the minute I met him, and, uh, you know, the funny thing is I got into, I got into, into uh, New England Conservatory, mm -hmm. which is where he was teaching <clears throat> when I went to school. But I, had, <clears throat> I didn't know they had a jazz department. Mm -hmm. And I had only taken, you know, I wanted to go to school for music, but my... Uh, at the time, the only school that my father knew of was Berkeley, mm -hmm. and Berkeley wasn't didn't have wasn't accredited in uh, any place but Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So he was saying, "Well, you know, if you're going to go for music, you might as well go to a really a school that gets that your degree will be good in other places besides Massachusetts." Mm -hmm. So I started figuring, okay, well then I got to learn some classical music because this is what I'm going to have to do. There are no back then. This is 1974. Mm -hmm. There were no jazz departments in schools, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Now it's such a huge industry. Right. And back then it was nothing. There was nothing. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I took, started taking uh, classical lessons two years before I had to audition at Manhattan School of Music Prep over here in Manhattan. And, um, and I got good enough to get into New England Conservatory. Mm -hmm. And when I got there, you know, I'm settling into my college life, and I'm thinking, now what do I do? I don't want to be a classical musician. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not where I'm at at all. So I'm taking my lessons, and, uh, and, and as life would work out, the first couple of weeks, I'm kind of miserable, you know, kind of just going through this thing and wondering what's happening. And then I see this group, this, this table of black dudes mm -hmm. at the cafeteria mm -hmm. sitting by themselves. So I go over to them and I'm like, hey, what's up, man? Who are you guys? You know? mm -hmm. And they said, well, we're in the jazz department. And I said, what? Jazz department? What jazz department? And then they told me that they had a jazz department. And I went right then and found Jackie Byard and auditioned for him that day because I was dying to get into a jazz department. Mm -hmm. And he took me right away and said, oh, yeah, you're going to be one of my best students. And he was beautiful to me <laughs> like that right off the bat, you know, just mm -hmm. he's 
walking around, you know, telling people, oh, it's my new student, man. You know? right. and, um, and so he's so nice that I, you know, I, to tell you the truth, I didn't know a lot about him when I got there. Mm-hmm. You know, I, he taught me so much. I didn't know what a genius I was being exposed to. I just knew that I had heard his name and he was the, the, the jazz teacher. And when I met him and found what a beautiful guy he was, he had me in his hip pocket right there. Yeah. I would do anything, he said. Yeah. And I did. And he was great, man. He had all this old stuff. He took me right back to Fats Waller, mm-hmm. Earl Hines, mm-hmm. and Errol Garner to begin with. Like yeah. he had all these things written out, these practice things you could work on. Mm-hmm. And then he'd take you into his stuff because his stuff was an extension of those guys, plus Bud Powell mm-hmm. and Monk. So he would take you into his stuff and start teaching you his things. He had these pieces written that showed you a lot of what he was about. And I'd say about the first 15 lessons were really worked out and really well, you know, mm-hmm. figured out. Then it turned into just he and I playing together at my lessons, two pianos. Wow. And those were in- incredible. And that's what I did with him for the rest of the time up there. Um, I just sat there and he'd play some incredible stuff and uh, I'd stop him and say, what's that? And what's that? And then he would tell me. And the point is this, I wouldn't have even stayed at that school if it wasn't for Jackie Byron because the town is too stiff. I don't like Boston. Mm -hmm. And the school was really stiff. It was really mostly classical kids. And like I said, all the black kids were sitting by themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that tells you a lot right there. I mean, Boston is a strange place. Mm-hmm. And I was not used to that coming from here. That was not what I was used to, sure. you know, coming from New York. Sure. So the racial thing was uncomfortable. Right. And um, <clears throat> they had just gone through this big thing to change the name of the jazz department at the Wayne Conservatory to the African-American Music Department. Mm-hmm. And so there was this big kind of, it made it, made it cool because they let, they let them do it, but it also caused even more of a, separation or a division it was kind of like they had a revolt in order to get this to happen and i don't know it was it wasn't cool up there yeah so all i'm saying is i would not have, that's how much i love jackie mm-hmm. and i said okay but you know what i gotta stay with jackie because this is the main thing i want to do and once i saw the scope of what he did and then i would hear him play mm-hmm. i just could see it was obvious that i couldn't be in a better place yeah then with that guy and then when I when we became lifelong friends after that and when I moved to New York he used to get me gigs teaching for him like at the new school Mm -hmm. and at Hart School of Music where he taught Mm -hmm. and stuff like that like he helped me out when I got here to uh, you know just to make some money and make a living man man that's beautiful that's beautiful but what a great what a great uh what a great thing because he gave you the whole history. See, he didn't just, now you know Jackie could play as avant-garde as he wanted right. or as in the pocket as he wanted or as, you know, he could play just like Errol Garner if he wanted. Mm-hmm. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I mean, he was an amazing, an amazing talent, man. And so, and plus his, his, his personality. Did you ever get to meet him? Man, I never did. I, he, he passed just when I was kind of getting legal and traveling around, man. But I, Oh, wow. I've got all yeah, the records. It was horrible of, how he, he was murdered. Yeah, yeah. In uh, his home. Yeah, that's... Which was just a tragic yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. Horrible oh, tragedy yes. because we lost one of the nicest people, first of all, and one of the greatest artists mm-hmm. in American history, I think. Um, I agree. 100%. Anyway, so that's my that's how I feel about him. Man, no, thanks for, thanks for sharing. Thanks for sharing that. And you moved to New York... Um, at a, at a crucial time, I would I would say in the, the the music, you know, unfortunately I was born too late to really experience it. But you know, the late seventies, the early eighties has always been kind of fascinating for me because you hear all these things about, well, you know, clubs are closing and so forth. But there's you know, Sweet Basil, there's there's Bradleys, and there's all these yeah. other rooms that I know. You know, you know there's always that older generation that says. Well, you really missed the day. You really missed the real deal. You know? sure. but like now, that's what I'm saying to my students. Mm-hmm. When I got here, that's what people were saying to me. Wow. Because they were saying like, well, <clears throat> you think New York is cool now. You should have been here in the 52nd Street days. Mm-hmm. And you should have been here when, you know, blah, 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 blah. And all these clubs and all these people were here. You know, there's always a better time. It does seem like jazz keeps, you know, it keeps... It keeps getting like a little bit less and a little bit less and a little bit less as the masters leave mm-hmm. the planet. Mm-hmm. And uh, of course, so the most masters are around, that's going to be the the, mo- the richest time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And 
And uh, luckily, I got here when there were still plenty of them around, even though, you know, there weren't as many as before my day. But but still, when I got here, there was still the old swing masters mm-hmm. and the bebop masters and the people bringing the music for. I mean, everyone was here. Like from, you go back to... Um, Dick Dickinson and Papa Joe Jones and Roy Eldridge mm. and I even played with Roy and Benny Goodman. Wow, old cats. And then, um, and then you come forward to like Art Farmer, Curtis Fuller, mm-hmm. Bags, you know, Milt Jackson, mm-hmm. and uh, Freddie Hubbard, and and it was even the other dudes like Eddie Lockjaw Davis and Johnny Griffin and yeah, I mean, so many Hank Jones and Tommy Flanagan and Barry and. Barry Harris, mm-hmm. they were all just thriving. I mean, they were probably my age that I am now mm-hmm. when I got here. Wow, okay. You know, and so, like, the way I... And it's funny, because I look at... I thought they were, like, these older guys, but I don't feel like an older guy right now. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, you know, so we, we got to see everybody. The The West End had all these old older cats playing up there, up on 114th Street and Broadway. Okay. That's where Papa Joe and... Um, Procope and Dickie Wells and guys like that played up there. Hmm. And then uh, Sweet Basil had Art Farmer, Curtis Fuller, Benny Golson, Jazz Tet, mm-hmm. and Cedar, mm-hmm. Walton and Billy Higgins, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, groups like that. Yeah. The Blue Note wasn't even here. There was no Blue Note. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I remember when the Blue Note opened, I used to live in the village on Carmine and Bedford Street, which is only a couple of blocks from where the Blue Note is. Mm-hmm. And I remember when they put that piano awning up outside, mm-hmm. and we saw, wow, the Blue Note, what's that? And it was nothing. You know, like <laughs> nobody went there, uh-huh. and they weren't hiring any big names. Mm-hmm. In fact, I had a steady gig there for like weeks with this guy, George Kelly, this old tenor player. Hmm before they took off. That's why I know that guy who owns it for all these years since the beginning. Mm-hmm. And... um it's funny what it became. I mean, when I look back now, it's like amazing to me yeah. how big the Blue Note is now. It's all in Japan and, you know, it's mm-hmm. all over the place in Italy. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, I was there before they it had nothing. When I came here, it was the Village Vanguard, mm-hmm. Sweet Basil, mm-hmm. Bradley's. Um, let's see, there was a place called Fat Tuesdays. Yes. There was a place called McKell's Uptown. Okay. And uh, these were the main places. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That people played all the time. I mean, big names, yeah. you know. And Bradley's actually let me in. You know, like Bradley's was more open to some younger cats. Mm-hmm. But you didn't have younger cats playing at the Village Vanguard mm-hmm. and stuff like that back then. It was just packed with, you know, the masters because there were still so many of them. They didn't need any younger cats. <laughs> and there wasn't this whole slant on youth either. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, there wasn't at, at all a slant on youth. In fact, nobody was recording, there, and there were no, you know, like, there were no Roy Hargroves, mm-hmm. there were no Christian McBrides, mm-hmm. there were no young, really talented guys who had their own bands, mm-hmm. playing their own music, forget it, that was, even Pepper Adams was going around pickup bands. Wow, wow. You know, and not playing much, in town. and that's why all these dudes were playing at Bradley's, because there were Hank Jones, Tommy Flanagan, Cedar, Barry Harris, Harold Mayburn, Monty Alexander, they were all playing at Bradley's because they weren't doing that much, really. You know, mm-hmm. like Bradley's was just a, a gig you did when you were in town. Wow. That's wow. why they had the place every week, somebody outstanding. Jimmy Rolls, mm-hmm. Dave McKenna, all these guys were in there every week. Mm-hmm. So, and six nights a week. Mm-hmm. But it's because, they were, and that's why Roy Eldridge was playing at Jimmy Ryan's. It was a Dixieland club. Yeah, wow. Here was one of the greatest, I mean, after Louie, you got Roy. Yes. Basically. Yes. The, the next innovative voice on trumpet. And he's playing at Jimmy Ryan's, in a, you know, just five nights a week. Wow. And it's like, wow, because that scene was, was dying mm-hmm. for straight ahead musicians. Mm-hmm. It was so, in, so much about fusion and... Um, and like Lou Donald says, confusion. <laughs> I mean, it was just, it was all electric and everything was Michael Brecker and, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, it was, you know, it was a whole other thing. The electric thing was coming in and Miles was doing all that stuff. And, yeah. And like these guys, like the, 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 the guys who stayed true to the, to the music were just waiting. Mm-hmm. They were sort of in waiting for the thing to turn around. And then it did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. they got older 
you know, you see each person start to take off. But Hank Jones wasn't doing much, and suddenly, like, the Japanese have discovered him, and boom, yeah. he was cooking again. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I saw all these things happen. I mean, I've been just sitting here in the trenches doing my gigs and biding my time and watching what's going on, and it really is true. Things go in cycles. Wow. You know, some people are down for a while, then boom, they're cooking again, and you can never feel like, oh, jazz is dead, because it just goes in these weird cycles and there's nothing you can do about it right. there's going to be lean moments and there's going to be moments when there's lots of activity for sure for sure man you hit on so much in that thank thanks again man for, for sharing about that two things sure. i wanted to ask you um number one to circulate in a place like that obviously you have to be a part of the scene you have to get around to the different clubs and i've seen also some facebook posts that you've made kind of instructing young musicians on the proper etiquette of how to introduce yourself to fellow musicians and to master yeah. musicians. What are some uh, things that you would say maybe from the way you did it and the way you saw it done to how you were able to introduce yourself to, to cats on the scene to let them know what you could do? Well, it's funny because we never did that. Like we never went up and said, Hey, here's what I can do. Well, let me introduce myself because I'm the new guy on the block. Right. You know, we just, we just went out and humbly listened to uh, the masters play mm -hmm. and we were, but we were out every night mm -hmm. doing that. See, that's a, that's the difference is that I see a difference now because we respected these guys so much. I mean, we all had the records. We had these guys on our records. So to go see them live every night was like a dream come true. Yeah. You know, that's why we moved here. Mm -hmm. So like we had no, there was no second thoughts about it. You went out all the time and you made your, you exposed yourself to the greatest cats. Now, when you're in their face week after week, month after month, mm -hmm. they get to know you, you know, so you get to, you go up and you say, Hey, you sounded great. And the first time that's all you say. And then the second time you might say, Hey, my name is Mike LaDon and you know, I play piano too. Mm -hmm. You might get a little conversation sure. and that's how it happens in a natural way, mm -hmm. you know? And then, and then, you know, you sort of were scared to death if they ever had to hear you play. You know? <laughs> but, yeah. You know, you were like, please, God, don't let this guy come <laughs> in when I'm, I never forget when I had to play at Bradley's. I mean, so many guys would be in there. It'd be Tommy Flanagan and Ray Bryant would be sitting right at the front table. And Max Roach would be there and mm -hmm. Freddie Hubbard and uh, Stanley Tarantino would be at the bar. It'd be like, jeez. And then you had to go out there and play in front of these guys, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And I was, I certainly was scared to death back in those days of all of that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you get over it. Yeah, and uh, and you and you each time you do it, you get stronger. Mm -hmm. And um, so these days, though, it's a little different. It's like everybody is so ambitious and so um, you know, so 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 business oriented. Mm -hmm. We were more music oriented. Okay, okay. I see a, like a different vibe now. With the, there, there's a lot of very strong musical talent out here. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that they're so focused on like getting in with guys who are going to advance them business wise they may not go see everybody that they should be going to see because mm -hmm. it's not it's not in the it's not you know politically smart they don't have to mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and that's a big difference hmm. and also they seem to be checking out more of the guys in the generation right next to theirs rather than the older guys mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and there's a there's a generational split that I, I don't remember Hmm. When I came here, hmm. you know, we never looked at the older guys as, oh, yeah, well, those guys are still stuck back in that old stuff. But man, we got our new stuff. We never, we always thought like we don't know anything, and we're going to learn from these guys because they know everything. You know? Yeah. That was the level of respect. It wasn't like, oh, well, they're still playing that old stuff, man. But we got our new stuff. And that's the kind of vibe I get sometimes out here too. Because hmm. there's been so many different facets. The music has split into so split into so many little tiny aspects yes. that you know these guys can you can run with anything now and and i see and that kind of bugs me and mm -hmm. that's the thing i write about on facebook mm -hmm. it bugs me that i see the um, let's say the african-american aspect of the music disappearing not that you have to be black to play that way but just that that vibe that aesthetic that feeling that comes from the blues that's been in the music all the time right. should probably be in there if you're going to call yourself a jazz musician of some kind. Now, that doesn't mean everything has to be that way, but, mm -hmm. you know, at some point you should have that in there. In other words, I just got through teaching at the University of North Texas. Mm -hmm. 
and many of the kids who came in to play were very talented and nice kids, but you know, some of them I had to say to them, I had to remind them, do you know that this is African American music, right? Mm. You know, like this is not, if you want to play classical music, you can go play classical music, or if you want to make some music that's like, sounds like classical music, go ahead. Mm -hmm. But if you're in a jazz school, and you're going for a jazz career, and you're going to name yourself a jazz musician, then you should have this stuff. You should be able to play a blues at a medium tempo, and I should be able to feel the feeling mm -hmm. that I know of as jazz yeah. when, you sit, when you sit down to play. If you can do that, then go ahead and play your classical stuff. More power to you, you know? Mm -hmm. But if you can't do that, then something's very wrong. Mm -hmm. And my fear is that if the thing goes too far, we're going to lose this. We're going to lose it altogether, which is what the old cats used to preach to me about. Wow. You know, just what they were preaching to me about is exactly what's happening, and I see it happening, and I want to stop it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I, well, That's what I'm doing on Facebook a lot of the time. It's just putting my thoughts out there. My thoughts are based on what they told me, mm -hmm. not something I thought up from my own ego. It's something that they taught me, and I've learned it not only from one, all of them. Mm -hmm. And I've been around so many of them. That I, and I mean like Sonny Rollins and Dizzy Gillespie and Milt Jackson and and, Be, and uh, Benny Golson and mm -hmm. James Moody and you name it, right. you know, and Harry Sweet that is it and Clark Terry and you know like these guys all taught me about what this music is. Mm -hmm. I never I didn't learn it out of a book, mm -hmm. so I'm trying to say to these guys, okay, look, they're not here to preach this stuff anymore. So you got unfortunately you got stuck with me, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm I'm going to put it out here because. Somebody needs to, because sure. it's getting out of hand. I mean, it's like you used to go to Europe and hear this kind of classical sounding music mm -hmm. and say, well, you know, that's the European style of jazz. But now I see this European style of jazz kind of taking over hmm. here. Hmm. And that's where the, that's where I get, I mean, it not, you know, New York City is one of the strongholds where we keep swinging. Yeah. But yeah. you go out there in the countryside, man, even here. In the schools, man, the young guys, they're all doing the, you know, the kind of the classical edge thing. And not swinging. This is the point. If you, if you get, you've got to get some swing in there, to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, they probably say I'm some old-fashioned conservative. I don't care what they say because I'm too old to care what people say. Yeah, Anyhow, yeah. But <clears throat> I just say, look, you can't swing. You've got to work on that because that's the feeling of jazz. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what separated it for all those years. You know, that's why there were so many frustrated uh, musicians from foreign lands because they felt like they couldn't swing like the Americans did. Right. And so now you've got that element being taken out. Now everybody's happy as hell. Hmm. They don't have to swing anymore. Wow. wow. So now everybody's like, you know, oh, I'm. The, and not only do they say they're the jazz musicians, they say they are the new jazz musicians. This is the new stuff. And if you do swing, you're out of style. You know, oh, you're oh. you're old fashioned. Mm. Mm. That's all backwards, and it's BS. Right on. So, you know, I try and say what I know to be true. And uh, some people get with it, and some people have really... Well, I've lost a lot of friends on Facebook over it. <laughs> I've been blocked more than once in my day. Oh, man. Oh, man. Keep sharing it, man. Keep sharing it. You, you've got a great, great legacy, man, and you've got a great, great story. Um, a couple more questions, man. I don't want to keep you too long, but I really appreciate this, man. This is fun. I, I wanted to ask you about two folks that you worked with, um, the great Milt Jackson, of course, and also uh, Benny Golson. You know, a lot of yeah. people really, really, the true fans of the music appreciated them over and beyond and above. And I'm sure you learn many valuable lessons from them, you know, on the road, you know, actually. Well, Benny, man, music. yeah, well, I, mm -hmm. Bags was like, you know, I, he was my favorite. Before I ever got with Bags, he had a band that was my very favorite band, bar none, uh, in the world. And it was with Cedar, uh -huh. Billy Higgins, and Ray Brown. Wow. And I'd go see those guys every night they were in town. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they were at the Vanguard Five Nights, I was in the Vanguard Five Nights. You know, if they were at McKell's, <laughs> I was at McKell's. Yeah. So um, James Williams was playing with him also. And James was getting busy. So he's the one who called me and said, look, I want you to go take my place in Philadelphia with Mel Jackson's quartet. I almost fell off my <laughs> bench. You know, I was like, what? Mm -hmm. And so I knew the music because I'd been hearing them and I had all the records and, you know, it wasn't hard mm -hmm. to go play with them. 
but it was very nerve wracking me stepping in there after hearing Cedar play that stuff, mm-hmm. you know, for so many years and, and uh, very intimidating. And at first I thought, you know, I'm never going to be able to do this, but I'm just going to give it my best shot. So mm-hmm. I went down there to Philly and it was in this funky little place. I was surprised. Mm-hmm. It was in a place called Jewels. Okay. Which had they had like well, with the name up on the ba- up on the front of the building with one of them with one of the letters missing out the name and so I was like this is where Bag was playing. Mm. That's funny. Yeah. So I walked in there and it was a soulful little place. Nice. Trudy Pitts had her organ up in the front part, and then the back part was like where they had the big name people. Mm-hmm. So we went back there and we played the set and we played the two sets. <clears throat> and when we got through, man, I. Uh, all night long, I just beat myself up. You know, you're not doing it, man. God, how could you be up here after Cedar's been up here? It's just... And so I went over to Milt afterwards, and I was basically just going to apologize to mm. him. And I, I went, I put, put my hand out, and I said, I'm sorry, man. You know what he did? He grabbed me, pulled me in, and gave me a big hug. Wow. He said, great, man. Love it. That's what he said. And then the next day, we had this meal at Mickey Roker's house, because he lives down there. Mm-hmm. He has a big house down there, and um, they made this big spread, man, and we got together for dinner, and man, we were all, me and Cranshaw, Mickey Roger, and Mill Jackson, we were family right there, and wow. we stayed like that for 11 years. Oh, my. Yeah, and it was amazing. I mean, just the things I learned from Bags were that, you know, you don't walk around, um, it doesn't take walking around like you're a genius to be a genius. I mean, this guy was the antithesis of somebody you would think like, oh, what a genius. You know, he wasn't temperamental. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was totally down to earth. Mm -hmm. All he liked to do was play pool, play cards, and play music and listen to music. That's it. Simple. And we just hung out like that all the time. Like on the road, he would cook. He also liked to cook. That's cool. So he would cook for us. He would find somebody's house to go to, and he'd buy all these groceries, and he'd make us dinner, and he'd bake pies. He was a good baker, too. Mm. So he'd bake pies. Like, we go to Japan, <coughs> he'd bring, like, a, a pineapple pie and a sweet potato pie that he baked on the plane with us. This is back before 9-11, so sure. you could do that. But we'd be up in first, we'd be up in business class passing the pies around. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And it was just, that's what it was. It was fun, man. Yeah. Just, Huge fun all the time, you know. And musically, what I learned from Bags was to focus, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you get you actually get relaxed when you're focused. Mm-hmm. You know, like it comes out more relaxed because you you're just you take you take command of what's happening when you're focused, mm-hmm. and you and you remain in control when you're focused. You know, and I look at Bags. His focus. If you look at Bags play, his eyes are dead set in the center of them vibes, man. Mm-hmm. Every note he plays, he's thinking, he's hearing, and he's just putting it out there, and it's coming right from the right place. Mm-hmm. You know, so I watch, I would watch him do that, <coughs> and I always tell my students who play piano, I say, watch Bags play, because the way his mallets are hitting them bars, mm-hmm. that's the way your fingers should be hitting the, the keys of the piano. Mm-hmm. That kind of focus, that kind of intense rhythm. You know, the way he did it, just bap, 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 and those notes were coming out and swinging like hell, and big, fat sound. You know, I said, that's what you want to do when you play the piano, play just like that. And uh, But Bags, you know, the thing about Bags is he loved arrangements. He loved Cedar Walton. Okay. That was his man. Bud Powell and Cedar Walton, those were his two favorite pianists of all time. Mm. And Cedar Walton, man, he just loved everything Cedar did, and so did I, of course. Mm-hmm. Probably why he liked me, because he knew I was so into Cedar. <laughs> and um, and so anyway, we did all those arrangements. And they were all, you know, the baggest thing was, don't go on a long time. You come out, you play a nice, really nice arrangement of the tune that swings, take a short solo, tune's over, and just give, keep giving him more tunes, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know? So... It had its thing. It taught me to take short choruses and get right to the point. Mm-hmm. It taught me how to come up with arrangements that were not too too complicated, but yet sound arranged. Mm-hmm. And stuff like that. That's that's what I got from, from, from Bags. Uh, with Benny Golson, Benny was more about really stretching the envelope. Like, he liked you to really go for it, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Go somewhere else, do something he had never heard before. Hmm. But he would never press you for that. How he would get it out of you is 
he would just keep telling you how great you were. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> he's an amazing guy. He just gives you compliments like you never heard such compliments. You know, oh, oh. you get through playing, he'd just be all over you, Mike. You're really playing there, man. Wow. Like that. You know? And here I am thinking, like, he's the guy really playing. But he'd make you think, like, he was nothing. And you're this great, fantastic. And I'll tell you what, it makes you feel good. You know? mm. And you play better. Mm. And you tend to feel more confident with that kind of support. So you go for stuff, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, and he really helped bring me forward, I think, huh. musically, out of what I was into originally. Mm -hmm and into something different, you know, and he always talked about that. Mm -hmm. And plus he is an eloquent, highly educated, fantastic, beautiful man. You know, I mean, just to be around Benny Golson, you're around a real gentleman, yeah. you know, and uh, true class. Mm -hmm. That's what, you know, so like just being around, but also so humble mm -hmm. and sweet. I can't say enough about it, man. See, I've been with Benny since, 97. Okay. Uh -huh. I don't even know how many years that is, but it's a lot of years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, he has always been the same. Hmm. Just this, And he's, you know, there's a lot of guys I've played with, but with some guys I've stuck. And he's one of the guys that I stuck with. Yeah. I mean, you know, he, he stuck with me, I should say. I didn't stick with him. Mm -hmm. He stuck with me mm -hmm. for, for the rest of the time. Like, we just hit it off, and he loves what I do. And he always stayed with me, wow. you know, which is there's a lot to be said for that, because a lot of people will stick with you for maybe a year or two and then, you know, move on, get somebody else, which is understandable, too. They change up mm -hmm. whatever. They want something different. Yeah. But Golson wants you to change up with him. Like you just keep growing in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he's, you know, he's, he's just a genius. I mean, think of the tunes that Benny Golson wrote. That's right. And think of his style. I mean, his playing style is so unique. Yeah. It's not coming out of Bird. Right. I mean, it is. He he loved Bird, but you're not hearing of you know straight up Bird, a la Sonny Rollins or something. Mm -hmm. When you hear Benny Golson, yeah. you're hearing Lucky Thompson, Don Bias, mm -hmm. like a whole a little bit different uh, slant on harmony. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you hear Benny Golson. And, uh, and and also, I always re admired him for that, too, because he's one of the few tenor players that, that managed to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and he also brought his own playing forward, just like Train did. I mean, mm -hmm. he's got some incredible harmonic stuff that is, mm -hmm. but it's his own. Yeah. And I don't think he gets nearly the due he deserves. Agreed. As, as a player. Agreed. Yeah. You know, people always talk about his writing, but his playing is just awesome. Yeah, yeah. And it still is, man. He's, you know, he's up in his upper 80s now. Yeah. And his playing is incredible. And so is his writing. I mean, we made this record. Have you ever heard the record New Jazz? New, the first one? New, New Time, New Tech. Yes, yes. Beautiful. His writing on there is just incredible, spectacular. Yeah, yeah. yeah it it is. really is. It really is. He's one of the best all around. And I guess... He is. I mean, and he's a truly unique voice, just like Horace Silver, who wrote, you know the jazz book yeah 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 for real so a uh, very very fortunate to be around him and uh very inspiring mm -hmm. very inspiring for sure for sure well mike man again congratulations this year you had a great great record with i love music um with oh, the Groover band man i really enjoyed that one um and yeah it spent quite a bit of time at the top of the charts uh radio it did. it did it did really well i was, I was hoping you know i kind of thought it would because mm -hmm. i've been grooming that that whole what could I say? Concept? I don't know what you would call mm -hmm. it. <laughs> just, mm -hmm. yeah. just the idea of something that people can relate to, but that also is challenging to play. Mm. And, you know, like the two worlds, like crossing the two worlds, putting them together. Yes. So that it doesn't have to be um, this divide between musical substance and, and, and gaining popular acclaim. Mm hmm you know, and so I, um, I found my, I found my thrill, you could say, <laughs> with, uh, with getting into the repertoire of, uh, you know, R&B from my day, mm -hmm. the tunes I grew up on. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I noticed it at my gig at Smoke, where I play all the time with organ, my organ band that's on that record. And, you know, I noticed the difference when, uh, when I started doing this thing, more people started coming in. Wow. 
you know, I said, and then when they were coming in, they were like, people didn't even, they weren't really jazz people, but they were just coming in because they knew, you know, they would tell their friends like, oh yeah, this is, this is jazz. You're going to like this jazz though. You know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not like the jazz that you might hear over there where it's a little boring and said, this, this stuff is good. Because mm -hmm. first of all, the organ is so great because it, I don't know if it's because it's electric or what, but it, it seems to, op it seems to <clears throat> kind of have appeal that piano doesn't with mm -hmm. the young folks. Yeah, yeah. You know, like piano might be too subtle or whatever, mm -hmm. um, but and you know, the, but the organ, they love it. Mm -hmm. So I get a lot more young folks. Actually, I think that the records I've been making are geared more towards young folks. It is mm -hmm. without a doubt mm -hmm. because I want I want young people to come back to this music for sure. But I don't want to put hip hop beats and stuff like that to make them do it. Gotcha. I want to still swing and let, and have them come back. Mm -hmm. So I figure if I do the the tunes that I'm doing, but swing them hard, because see that's the other thing is there ain't enough guys out here swinging hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, but if you swing those tunes hard and really put that feeling in there, you'll see them young people start tapping their feet. You know, some of them will do the mock swing dance, you know, where they <laughs> stick their fingers in the air and act <laughs> stupid. Yeah. But that's that's very rare. Sure. Most of them sit there and they're just like their jaws are open and they're 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 saying, "I've never heard anything like this," mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly they like jazz and they want to buy my records and they're you know they're coming up and saying, "Can we get a CD of this because we never heard anything like this?" Mm -hmm. When really all I'm doing is the same old thing. You mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm swinging up there and playing playing jazz music, which is you know that's the thing. It still it still can feel good yeah. to hear some swing. It truth. never died. It's just like any good groove, you know. It's just like look at what Latin people do, right? Like Latin people have a culture, mm -hmm. and their music grew out of that culture, and they all still in love. They're all still in love with the main, the main music that they've always been in love with. Right. You know, I mean, Latin people have a true musical heritage that they're all aware of. They're into the history of it, and I really love them for that. You know. Mm -hmm. And when you hear salsa music, it's got that dance thing to it. It's just irresistible. Mm -hmm. That's the same way it should be with, with our music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It should still swing. That's our, that's our clave, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it should be that dance thing that makes people just wiggle around their seat because they can't sit still because it's so exciting to hear. You know, it's got that energy, that sparkle. Mm -hmm. And um, just, just like funk music did back in the 70s, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you hear James Brown's group, and you hear those pockets that those guys hit, you're gonna feel it that's inside. It. That's it. Because it's just so great, and it's the same. That's why I try and tell these guys like it's the same thing with jazz. Well, it's a different groove mm -hmm. than James Brown's naturally, but it should it should groove that hard. Mm -hmm. You know, the pocket should be there, just like it is in pop music when it's a good pocket. Except it's a little harder to hit a good swing pocket. Mm -hmm. Because there's so many you don't have a set. And things that with jazz are all up in the air. The bass line's not set. Piano player doesn't have a set part. We don't have set parts. Right. You know, we were just making this stuff up, and it's always different. So it's a little more hit or miss. Mm -hmm. Still, man, when I came here, if you couldn't swing, and if the soloist couldn't swing, I mean, you could get a guy. I remember Jimmy Ryan's when I used to work there. Mm hmm and these are old cats, man. They come back, <laughs> back way back in the day. And you know, somebody new would come in and like play kind of like a Coltrane imitator uh -huh. that didn't really swing. Oh boy! And he'd be playing his ass off, though. I mean, they'd say like, you know, I could hear that the harmonically the guy was very advanced and knew his stuff, mm -hmm. was playing good to me. Mm -hmm. But those guys, once he'd get off the band, if he wasn't really informing the rhythm with the rhythm section, was if he wasn't, I mean, informing is the wrong word. I should say if he wasn't, adding mm -hmm. to the rhythm of the rhythm section mm -hmm. with his rhythm they'd be like that's a booger <laughs> don't ever let him up here again <laughs> you know that's, that's what they call him a booger <laughs> you know to me he'd be like i mean in a music school situation he'd be like one of the top students sure. but the, the the viewpoint wasn't how many scales and harmonic schemes can you play the viewpoint was what is your rhythm about and are you, are you helping us ri raise the level of our swing up here? Mm. That was where the focus was. All on swing. It was all on rhythm. They'd rather have you play simpler and, 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 and inject more swing into the band 
than to get up there and take over with all your ideas and the swing goes down. Right. See, and that's what I was preached about as a rhythm section player. Mm-hmm was like, don't you ever let the swing go down, man, never. You gotta keep it way up, even if you have to simplify your stuff, we don't care about what you know. We don't wanna hear that. We just wanna hear you swing and make the swing get deeper and deeper. Wow. That's it. So that's how heavy I was preached to about that stuff. So it's, it's really been a turnaround. I haven't been out here that long, mm. but there's been a complete turnaround where now it's like, no more swing. Mm. Avoid swing. If you wanna be new and different, you don't swing. That's mm. it. Get the swing out. <laughs> Put something. Out. Look at Robert Glasper. I mean, that's that's you know that's my point right there. Wow. A very talented guy. He can do anything he wants. I'm sure. Mm-hmm. And God bless him, man. He hit on something golden. I mean, he is doing fantastic. But it's not swinging. Mm-hmm. Not not like what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. You know, he's got the hip hop beats and all this kind of stuff going. And that's, of course, that's nothing new, man. You put some pop element in your music, you're going to do better. Mm. You know, if you, you take the, you take the swing away, that's where the art is though to me. The art of jazz is in swinging. You know, mm-hmm. that's, mm-hmm. that's the huge part, the human element. That's the thing a computer can't do. You know, a computer could play any scale, any harmonic scheme, probably think of things that no human being has ever thought of. Mm-hmm. But it can't swing. So the swing is the human. The rhythm is the whole human element in the music. But today, I remember getting in a fight with this on, on Facebook because they were like, well, man, you know, just look what Robert Glasper's doing. I mean, any records that are not like Robert Glasper's are doing lousy in jazz. Mm-hmm. His are the top, top records for sales. Mm-hmm. And if you want to do good, you do that. I don't like to hear that. <laughs> that's not what I want to hear because that's not really a truly a jazz thing. Right. That's a mixture and it's, it's on the tree, mm-hmm. but it ain't at the roots. Gotcha. You know, it's on the tree for sure. And that guy, I mean, you know, I have heard stories. I don't know him, mm-hmm. but I've heard stories that he could do anything and he play, could play like Herbie and he could do this and that. I never heard him do all of that. But, you know, I can see what he's doing is getting over very well, and it's exactly what I'm talking about. It's anything that's not jazz is going to get over great, and they're going to call it the new jazz. That's mm-hmm. what I see, mm-hmm. honestly. Mm-hmm. That's what I see. It's like, you want to have a new you want to have a new concept? Have no concept. <laughs> <That's what I laughs> the less concept you got about the real thing, the better you are today. And it's backwards, man. But you know what? This is nothing new because this is exactly what Papa Joe Jones was preaching to me back when I was in my 20s. Same. If nothing changes, Mm -hmm. this is nothing new. It's the same old crap. Wow. Yeah, the same old stuff. He used to tell me, he used to say, everything's upside down. North is south. East is west. Everything's backwards. They got the, the, the worst people at the top and the top people at the bottom. You know, he was telling me that way back then. And I'd be like, oh, come on, you're just, it can't be that bad. And it wasn't back then. I mean, he was, if he was around now, he wouldn't believe what's going on. Right. He right. would not believe it. But nonetheless, I'm, uh, I'm happy to say that I see young people now that come to my gig getting back to the swing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, kids just, just still in college. But there's a nucleus of youngsters that are definitely coming back Mm -hmm. to the real deal and not being swayed by the hip hop thing or putting some pop beat thing to your music and whatever. What would you call it? You know, just some kind of uh, novelty kind of device Uh getting over by some kind of novelty thing. Mm. You know, you got to have some courage to try and get over with the real thing. Yeah. Yeah. And now I see kids with that courage now, man. They're like, no, we're swinging. We're listening to Cedar. We're listening to Bags, you know, we're into Art Blakey. Mm-hmm. We're listening to Hank Mobley, mm-hmm. all the real stuff. Yeah. yeah. And not that they should sound like those guys revisited, mm-hmm. but if you're coming from that, you're on the right track as far as I'm concerned. Right on. Right you know? On. Anyway, are you, do you play, Greg? I play uh, electric bass, actually. Yeah. But, oh, you do? Yeah, but I like I like to swing, man. I like to groove, too. I, I mean... When I heard you guys, man, um, this summer at Smoke, it was incredible. You did kind of a, uh, 
There's one tune you played that I really dug called The Boss. I think that you wrote. Oh, yeah, that's my tune. Jeremy, I love that song. I love that song. And there oh, was that's a, great. There was another uh, version of uh, Maiden Voyage that you guys took a trip oh, through. Oh, wow, thrust. yeah. That was fun, too. That was fun, too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, like, I like to mix up different vibes and different fields and stuff, too. Yeah. I mean, I'm not just, uh, but you can believe what my listening is like. My iPod, uh-huh. it's ridiculous. I put it on shuffle. It's a whole lot of different stuff. I'm, for instance, I'm very into uh, like contemporary gospel Word. music. Yeah, yeah. Just for the just for the pockets that those guys hit and the arrangements. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I still listen to my R and B stuff. I still love it. Like I just bought it yesterday. Yeah, man. You know, and uh, and I'm also very deeply into classical music, wow. and have been for years. That's really cool. You know, and I've really checked that out, and I know was you know, I mean, and, and I didn't check it out because of any kind of schooling thing. I just got into it, like for music, wow. and I just love it. And I know, and I know all of, you know, all I have thousands of classical CDs, and you know, there's all kinds of stuff that I'm listening to. It's not just like I'm Mr. Jazz purist, and all I do is listen to some guys that swing. Right, right you know, I like pockets, man. Sure, same here. You man. know, if you hit a pocket, like even a funk pocket, mm-hmm. that's special. Yeah. Yeah. It's not easy. It's not. It's not, man. It's not. You know, that's some special stuff, man. I mean, if it, that's why, you know, yes, James Brown's very repetitive. Mm-hmm. But they never lose the pocket. That's it. That's it, man. That's it. You know, the pocket just stays there, and it just always feels good. And you could listen to it for forever. You know? exactly. If it feels good, you can just sit there and groove on it forever. That's it. You know, and so, yeah, it's repetitive, but so what? Right, right. That's hard. That's hard to do. And, you know, it's a, it's a great thing to have happen when you get guys that, and, and think of how many pockets he thought they, they came up with. Totally. <laughs> and very totally. different ones. Yeah, yeah. You know, and every time they hit one, it's like gold. And that's how I see the gospel music now, too. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I go through searching. A lot of it is similar. Yeah. But if you really search, man, you find that one nugget. Man, you say, "Whoa, what That's is right. this stuff?" That's right. This, some guys are some of those guys are creating incredible stuff out there, and I love the whole thing. I like the words, mm-hmm. the singing, mm-hmm. and the pocket. Most definite. Most and definitely. the harmonies. You know, the whole thing. I said, <clears throat> "That's where Earth, Wind, and Fires, and you know, uh, Ohio players and stuff. That's where they went mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to the gospel. That's where that music is That's, now." Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It's not in R&B no more. No, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. You know, it is. But, I mean, at least it's still out there. People are still creating that kind of substance. Right on. You know, in, in that music. Most that's what it's all about. And it, if it's honest and you're doing it and you're creating music of substance, then you're doing something great with your life. Right on. As far as I'm concerned. Right on. Much better than trying to, you know, make uh, hustle everybody's money into your pocket. <laughs> sure thing. Sure you know, thing. because there's no place like New York, as far as I can see. I mean, I've been all over the world. There's nothing even close right. to right. the vibe in here because it's, you know, the best cats are here. Yeah. And the people are serious about this stuff. That's there's a lot true. of BS, too. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of everything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. York's got a lot of everything. It's got a lot of great musicians, got a lot of sad musicians. Yeah. It's got a lot of really honest, good people. It's got a lot of lying, fake people. You know, mm-hmm. It's, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's got a lot of everything. But the good thing is that there are really great musicians here, and there's a lot of swing going on and a lot of seriousness about the music. That's awesome. Maybe sometimes overly serious, but nonetheless, they're serious about it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's, and it's not into the... It hasn't really sunk to the Euro jazz thing yet gotcha. you know not like other other places i've been which are totally just doing that yeah i mean that's what i call it i don't really know you know all these names they're just for there for reference point <clears throat> yeah people yeah. get into the naming you know they don't like to call jazz jazz and they don't like i don't know i don't even know how to talk about stuff anymore so i just use the old terms and i don't care if people get mad sure, at me sure. you know i mean i still call it jazz exactly yeah. I know people say American classical music and African American music and mm-hmm. uh, Black American music yeah. and you know I don't even know. <clears throat> There's so many names for it now. It's hard to speak about it. <laughs> it's, it's the truth. Because you truth. don't know like who's going to get mad. Right. You yeah. know I've had that happen on Facebook too. Yeah, I've seen. You it. Know, I start saying jazz and I'm like, that's because there is no jazz anymore. You idiot. You know oh, I was like, okay. Oh, I don't know. It's just a name. Right. Exactly. 
it's just a name, man. I mean, you know, whatever you want to call it, call it that. You know, I just, that's what I call it. It's like all these handshakes people come up with, and they get so complicated. I was like, look, just give me the same old-fashioned one, man. Because, right. like, right. I don't know the whole thing, you yeah. know? Yeah. I don't know the whole new handshake, man. I can't, I don't get it with that. Mike Ladon there with the Groove of Quartet, I Love Music, the title track to his latest on High Note Records. That's definitely one that's a keeper. If you haven't checked it out, I recommend that you do so. Peter Bernstein, of course, on that one with Joe Farnsworth, the drummer, Eric Alexander on tenor saxophone, and the band leader and Hammond organist, Mike Ladon. Man, Mike just tells it like it is, and he's seen a lot. Man, talk about coming to... New York in the late 70s and early 80s and just being around all those different um, cadre of musicians man the swingers the beboppers the guys bringing it forward and people in his generation that are now the age that he was um, or that the masters were when he moved to New York so man Mike's seen a lot you can catch him every Tuesday at Smoke. This is yours truly, the Watchman over the microphone for Jazz Watch. Hope you really enjoyed the podcast today. Be sure to leave us some feedback. You can rate us on iTunes. You can also subscribe to us for free on there. We're at Stitcher Radio, distributed through them as well. We thank the kind folks at Stitcher for uh, keeping us before the people. And you, you, and you, if you know a friend that might be into what we're putting down make sure to turn them on to us facebook.com slash jazz watch gb jazz watch at gmail.com is our email address you can also visit us on our mother site as we like to call it that's jazzwatch.wordpress.com. we'll check you out real real soon make sure that you continue to hear the other music till next time right on